Hi there, and thank you for joining us for this edition of Capital Update. Since we've uh, taped last, we've had a special session, and there has been a lot going on in that time frame. And today, as always, we have our three representatives, or two representatives and senator joining us to talk about what happened and to answer some questions that you may or may not have thought about that happened during that session. So Jerry, Cindy, David, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Thanks. You know, as we were uh, sitting here talking before the start of the show, Jerry, we were talking about the special session and, and why we go into special session. And as always, you've done some research <laughs> and, and you have some history and, and uh, well, you know, I'm just going to hand it off to you about the special session and why we have them and, and some, some different, you know, fa fun facts about it. All right. Well, thanks, Randy. And uh, yes, we did have a special session. Um, our history is that since 1858, when uh, the state was established, um, special sessions were set up to be an extraordinary circumstance, things that would happen that were beyond the control of the legislature and the need to call it back. In our first 75 years of statehood, we had only seven special sessions. The first one was called out for the uh, Sioux Uprising, the Indian War you know, around New Ulm. And uh, then we didn't have any for a long time until the uh, Great Depression in the 1930s. And we had a couple of special sessions to deal with uh, relief for our citizens. And then we also had uh, some issues with regards to the soldiers returning from World War II. So that brings us up to 1935. Then from 1935 to 1975, we had 14 special sessions. And then from 1975 to the present, the next 40 years, we've had 30 special sessions. So the trend has been <laughs> doubling you know, in these increments. And it's uh, notable that um, of the special sessions in the last 40 years, most of them, about 18 or 19 of them, have been budget-related issues regarding uh, education and education spending. Uh, special sessions. That, that's and, the primary topic that's, for, for that, the last 14. Well, not the last 14 consecutive, but of the last 30 during the 40 years okay. have been uh, largely inclusive of education spending and disagreement on, uh, on the amount of money that should be spent on uh, education. Um, we also had uh, six special sessions for floods. We had a couple other for um, uh, iron mining workers uh, during a slowdown in the 80s in terms of uh, extending unemployment benefits. And then we even had one special session uh, requested by the Dayton Hudson Corporation uh, apparently to stave off a hostile takeover uh, of their company uh, in changing some laws here. So um, my point is, is that these are supposed to be extraordinary circumstances, and what we've seen in this last uh, session, and Governor Dayton started out the very biennium of this, this new session, uh, threatening uh, government shutdown, uh, threatening uh, gridlock, um, and I was very concerned that, that we would be heading to a special session, and I expected it, I had predicted it, and I, uh, thankfully we didn't have a shutdown, but I thought that's where he wanted to go. And, uh, you know, it, it's a little troubling because normally you would, you would veto bills because it, it has something in it that you can't live with. Or you would veto a bill because it's too expensive or it spends too much money. Here we had a circumstance where the governor vetoed bills because it did not have provisions of a bipartisan legislation, didn't have provisions in it in which he wanted. And so in closing on this issue, uh, it's important to note that if the governor really wanted something, and he should have laid out his agenda early right. in the game. Governor Dayton has not even given his state of the state addresses in the last two years, April 30th and April 9th. Both of those dates are well beyond committee deadlines for turning in bills. So if he even wanted his own legislative members, members of the DFL caucus, to advocate for, for his uh, priorities, um, that simply wasn't done. And uh, those bills uh, weren't introduced. And, and uh, we put together a bipartisan uh, uh, bills with the uh, DFL Senate and the Republican House. And, and it was truly, uh, even in uh, Senator Bach's own words, uh, in all the years that he's been here, is the, truly the most bipartisan legislation he's ever seen. But the governor went ahead and vetoed it. So I don't think the governor should be uh, legislating from the executive branch. That is a separation of power that's reserved for the legislature. And that's what appears he's doing. That's interesting. You know, when you describe the special session, it's interesting because it's not special session, it's normal session now, really. <laughs> it's business not completed. And 
all I can think about with that is if, if that was any one of us outside, each of us have jobs outside of, you know, each of you have jobs, you'd be fired if you couldn't get your work done in, in the prescribed amount of time. And Absolutely. here the governor is see, sitting there saying, the polls say they're with us, let's push this because they won't blame the DFL, they'll blame the GOP for, for the shutdown. So very, very interesting fact that most people don't realize. We shouldn't be having them. And I say this kind of tongue in cheek, we ought to pass a law that says we can't go to special session unless it's truly special or extraordinary uh, yes. circumstances. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. So, well, thank you, Jerry. Yeah. So, Cindy, you know, as we were talking about the special session as well, we, we talked about some of the things that the DFL and, you know, with control of the governorship and the, the Senate wanted to get done, things that they wanted to do. One of them was transportation, and you had a few other things. And you, you talked about how the fact that the House and, and the GOP mm -hmm stayed together, worked together, and really worked for the people. Do you want to talk about that a little bit more? Sure. Um, I think that was definitely one of our um, one of our successes in a big way, and it offered the fact that we stuck together as a caucus, and we were really clear with our leadership that we were all behind them. That made it very much easier for them to, in the negotiations with the governor. Um, so that was, you know, definitely something that I feel really good about. I, I think that one of the most important things um, that we did as a Republican uh, caucus, um, House majority, is what we stopped. Um, a number of things that we stopped. Universal pre-K is the one that most definitely comes to mind. Um, in all of the feedback that I received from constituents and, and members received a lot, it was crystal clear that this had bipartisan opposition. So as Jerry just mentioned, the governor didn't state that as one of his top objectives until well after the committee deadlines. So um, I feel really, really good that we stopped that. And as a result, we, we spent more money than I would have liked um, to see on education. But the early childhood scholarships are really a form of uh, school choice for parents, for the most needy parents um, of children, and I, I'm, you know, pretty pleased that that's how we made um, education investments. You know, given given that the other thing that I feel terrific about having stopped for a number of reasons is the largest gas tax in the history of the state of Minnesota, and um, for for several reasons, one of which is the monies that would have gone to transit. Um, and the Southwest light rail is such a boondoggle already um, that that would have been the ball game as far as I'm concerned. So I feel just terrific that we stopped that. And of course, it will come up again, no doubt. Um, but I'll just leave it at that. It felt pretty good. You, you know, you say no doubt, and, and I, I think it's an interesting transition for me that, you know, Representative Doubt got a lot of accolades through this whole process about his negotiation skills as a, as a relatively a new person mm -hmm. in, in this whole process. Mm -hmm. And with us only having one leg of the stool, us, you know, the GOP, I thought they did a great job. In fact, for the media, who doesn't usually cover the GOP very well in the state of Minnesota, to come out and actually say what a great job they've been doing and there wasn't a lot of negativity on mm -hmm. our part. They did. I thought that was a great show for, for you guys and, and the work that you did and how you worked together. One thing I want to state, because Jerry, you talked about it with special sessions and how you said many of the last, you know, over the last 30 years has been education, and you talked about education. I think our viewers forget about this fact that there's this tendency to say that we as Republicans don't like education. And I think everybody needs to remember that education makes up the largest portion of our budget every time, and it gets one of the largest increases every time. 17.2 billion this year, right. or this biennium. Which is a $1.4 billion increase over the last biennium. And, and so we never that is really no take that. your We're breath saying, away spending. Yes. Um, and, and, you know, as our constituency puts education as, as number one. And so it is, it is a wise investment um, to be, you know, to be in, spending in education but right. that's a that's a lot right. of there's good spending. spending and then there's the spending that we saw them want to do with pre-k and, and everything else mm -hmm. now senator you sat on the other side of the aisle in the minority and waiting for things to come versus driving the show like cindy and, and um, uh, jerry had on the other side talk to us a little bit about you know what was happening there. i know you want to talk about the ag bill a little bit but what was it like for you being on the other side not in the majority watching what was going on and, and what work you were able to do well it was sort of fun to watch a circular circular firing squad occur and uh, you know we went into special session with 12 hours notice 
and we all did our best trains, planes, and automobiles impression to get back to St. Paul uh, in time. And actually, I was a little bit late. I think, Cindy, you made it out. We were actually at the same conference in Washington. Um, but we got back, I got back about 12.30 and just in time to start watching the Ag Bill. Um, you know, go, stick, taking a step back, you know, got, I, I recognized that the special session had to occur, but it didn't occur until it had to occur because we were going to start sending out layoff notices on Monday if we didn't get it done on Friday. Again, we wait until the last minute to get anything done, which is the wrong way to go. So, uh, but we got back in time to basically pass the same bills that we passed the first time through. Unfortunately, we were in this position because the governor chose to hold out for a gas tax. That was his first hostage he took when he started to veto bills. And after he didn't get that, because everybody realized and the polls were against him 70-30, everybody in Minnesota said, if you've already got $2 billion, why do you need more of my money? Mm -hmm. So he backed away from that. Then he brought up that pre-K, universal pre-K. And no school district wants this. No superintendent wants this. School board members didn't want it. Why? They don't even have enough space to try and accommodate universal pre-K. And we did the right thing in putting together scholarships that were the right angle to go. And, and that's something to say again, because a lot of people hear this and they think it's the right thing to do. The schools were saying, we don't want this because we don't know how we can get it done. That, that's what I heard from a lot of different school districts across the state, and everybody else was saying that and, as well. And the governor's proposal was half-day pre-K. It wasn't fully funded. It didn't pay for the facilities that David's alluding to. It didn't pay for transportation costs. didn't pay for uh, the additional meal costs or things that would be included in that. And most importantly, 70% of parents of uh, pre-K are uh, both working in the workforce, and they can't have a half-a-day program. Right. They need flexibility. They need a program that will, will accommodate their work schedule. And right. Many of them already have their children in private sector programs that they, that they love. Um, so between all of the things that were mentioned, the logistical challenges for the school districts, strapping little four-year-olds in school buses, new, right. new accommodations would have been required there. Yeah. Yep. So the second hostage was the pre-K. So then we moved on to hostage number three, which was the state auditor, and that I know that hits strikes yeah. home for you. We can come back to that topic, yeah. but you know he struck out on all three of them. Yeah. Uh, so then we went into special session, and we brought up the ag bill. And ag bill was one of the issues that was a significant that the governor had significant issues with, mostly because of uh, and some of the environmentalists in my in the DFO caucus had big problems with it because it was getting rid of the citizens board of the PCA. What people don't understand about, about that removal is the Citizens Board of the, pre, uh, of the PCA was a good idea 40 years ago. Well, guess what? A Pinto was a good idea 40 years yeah. ago. How's that working out? And how is that working out for you? The answer is, is that you know, we, we, have a, we had a case called Baker Farms, and it's out in Stevens County. And the PCA signed off on it. They, all of their professionals, they all did the studies. They did all the work. They all went out. They did everything they had to. All the professionals and the BC, PCA board, which is already also appointed by the governor, did their work, did the, what's called an environmental assessment worksheet. They signed off on it. Well, the, P, the PCA citizens board got a couple of people, which you know we understand the acronym NIMBY, uh, the, not in my backyard people came in and, and were complaining and making up things. Well, the Citizens Board decided they were going to force an environmental, another uh, in, called an EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, which causes millions of dollars for the operation, could but take upwards of down. years. It exactly. It slows the process down. So Baker Farms said, forget this, and took their operation, took those jobs, took that tax revenue, and moved it to, I believe it was New Mexico. So the Citizens Board decided they were going to overrule the professionals because of a couple of people with no explanation. The Citizens Board had provided virtually no explanation on why they wanted that. And they stopped, they sent those businesses to a different state. That's why the Citizens Board no longer is functional. And if people really need to have help at the Capitol to deal with a PCA situation or an environmental situation, they have people called senators and representatives, which are just fine people that can work with the PCA and advocate on their behalf. Well That's said. a lot of stuff, Dave. Well <laughs> it is. So, but you know, so we're going to go to break here right now. But I mean, this is just interesting. When we come back, we'll talk more about the special session. I do want to touch a little bit on the auditor and, and what happened with the auditor stuff, and we'll, we'll chat about a few other things. So, uh, stay with us. We'll be right back.
welcome back. As we went to break, we were talking about the special session and how the governor, in three different times, tried to extend or prolong or said he wasn't going to end the special session. And, and one of the reasons really caught my attention, as you would well know, and it had to do with the state auditor's office. I know you all remember about the fact that I had a special um, session announcement on this very fact mm -hmm. that our auditor is not doing her job and it's actually overcharging a lot of the counties for, for the jobs. And, and I don't want to make this about me, but Cindy, this came out of your committee, one of the committees that you sat on, okay. about what should happen and why this even came, came to be. So why don't you, you tell us a little bit more about sure. why this happened? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And it was simply ridiculous because, as we were talking earlier, the governor had just signed the bill that this uh, provision was in, the state government finance omnibus bill, the committee on which I serve. And then he threatened to not call the special session until we agreed to uh, nullify or void or I don't know what, to, you know, get rid of that provision that he had just signed. So it was just totally ridiculous. I, so let, I, let's just take a moment so the people know. I mean, this provision allowed, there's, there's 87 counties. Yes. Of them, 22 have the right to go into the free market and get anybody. They, they can, already have, right, yes. And they can use the state auditor if they want. Mm -hmm. None of them do. Mm -hmm. They all go to the private sector. So there's um, 65 other counties in the state Correct. that the state auditor audits. And they there was a handful of them. It wasn't all of them. I think there was 12 or 14 that came forward and said, please let us go to the private sector. Yes. And this provision allows them to go to the private sector or the state auditor if they it choose does. to go. It was chief authored by the vice chair, uh, Representative Jeff Howe, and I very specifically recall the uh, several uh, communities, several counties uh, coming into committee and testifying. Uh, the the potential resources that they have the wherewithal to save for their taxpayers were significant. They were all extremely conscientious um, uh, testifiers, and you know I was I was just delighted to vote yes for that bill and would do would do so again. Sure. It really only made sense. Well, it brought the power back to the county, it, and it's saving the it taxpayers did. money. And so, for someone like myself, representing uh, two counties, Hennepin County and Carver County, Hennepin County already has this privilege. Carver County, on the other hand, doesn't. Does not. Right. And so now they do have the opportunity to decide if they'd like to get some competitive bids. They may or may not decide to go with uh, a, a private sector auditor and the auditor never came to committee she never testified making a compelling case um, not to mention her office still has the wherewithal to come in and do an audit of of the audit if she has a concern in any way so this is um, a matter of local control and I'm just delighted that it that it passed. Yeah, and I was as well. And I don't want to beleaguer that point because I could go on and on about other things with that. But I'm just happy yes. to see that bipartisan support. This was not a Republican driven deal. This was not no. a Democrat. This was something that they said the people deserve. And I was so excited about that. Yes, it was. It was you a also plus. have to remember that every city uses private, every school board mm -hmm. uses private, 22 counties use private. The anomaly is the 65 who are forced to use it. So really, uh, we were just letting uh, 65 counties do the same thing as the rest of Minnesota right, gets to do. Equalizing the table for, for the rest. So, David, as, as you, you brought that up, I and mean, we were talking about equalizing the table and everything else, the, the governor has decided that he needed to equalize some pay with his, uh, his commissioners. And it was a one-day deal that was set up, I forget how long ago when that, when everybody got all, their, all uh, arms up in the air about this. But I'm going to turn that to you to talk about the fact that it was just, what, last week that the governor went out there and gave a lot of pay raises. Well, let's step back and let's, let's go to 2013 to start with. In 2013, we had two different things that we did in the legislature. And one was we uh, gave, this, we gave the, the governor the ability to do this. That was passed on a partisan vote. Every Democrat in both chambers passed that bill to give to the governor, who's a Democrat, to actually have that authority. We gave them that authority, not with my vote, not with their, not the other two votes here at the table, but we gave them the authority, the governor the authority to do this. Um, we also, in 2013, did something else. We have a constitutional amendment ballot question coming up in the 2016 election. To do what? to take our salaries, the ability for us to, as legislators to raise our salaries away from them. Now that might sound like a good thing, and here's how I'm going to tie these two together. Earlier in the year, 
the governor announced what he was going to do. He was going to jack salaries, some of them by over 100 percent. How many people in Minnesota have 30 percent raises, much less 100 and some percent raises? Right. The legislature, rightfully so, was outraged. Mm -hmm. We passed the bill through both chambers. I didn't actually vote for it because I knew it was going to happen, and I stood on the floor of the Senate saying exactly what was going to happen is on his one day where we, they gave him the authority again for one day only to make those raises, he was going to put them all back exactly where he put them. Well, he did. Now, here's the tie-in. We're feathering the nests of political appointees. That's who they are. They are not CEOs. We keep talking about them being CEOs, and I was actually on TV about a week ago talking about how comparing commissioners to CEOs is like comparing an apple to a bowling ball. They're both round. That's the only thing that's close to being accurate about them. Um, we're in the process of feathering the nest of political appointees. That's what I say this is. We're also in the process of hiding our own salary increases because that ballot question, if you vote yes to take away our ability and our legislative ability to manage our salaries. If I raise my salary 100%, I want you as the public to have the ability to vote me out of office if you think Correct. that's wrong. I will no longer have that ability. What we're going to do is create a little blue ribbon fact-finding task force. And they're going to do, I'm sorry, exactly what the Democrats at, in St. Paul want to do, which is raise our salaries for us because they think we are underpaid. Uh, if you're going to vote yes on that, it, it all comes down to feathering this. A few weeks ago, we feathered the nest of, of the commissioners, and now we're going to change the rules, and we're going to hide, and we're going to use all kinds of sub subterfuge to give ourselves salary increases. That's the kind of thing that Governor Dayton and the DFL really have been doing. I hate to be so negative about it, but that's the truth of that. Well, and, and there's a lot of committees like that. I mean, we had our, one of our friends become a regent, and we know there's issues with the way the regents are selected and, and how they get presented to you with the legislatures to be selected. So it's this one and probably 15 other boards that we should really be taking a look at in the next mm -hmm. time you guys get together to see if we cannot get some of these taken away and keep, keep it more transparent because it's not transparent when you know, this Blue Ribbon Board would get together or the Regents Board. The, the, people just don't realize what's happening. So stay on that, uh, Senator. I know that's uh, something that's near and dear to you. And I think we got to keep the fact that some people got some huge raises that maybe weren't deserving. They think they were deserving, but others would not. Jer, in the final minutes of, uh, of their meeting here today, I want to bring it back to you. you. You told us about special sessions and how they're not so special anymore. They're kind of ordinary versus the way that they were. And I'm going to look at you and say, you know, as the, the, um, the pragmatic man that you are, should this session have happened? Do you think we could have avoided it? What, what do you think should have happened so that we weren't spending the hundreds of extra thousands of dollars to have this special session? Well, I, I think the actions should be suspect. Um, it appears that you know, the governor's rhetoric early on uh, was talking about the compromises that they are going to have to make to avoid a shutdown. And uh, so that was a very partisan, one-sided point of view that uh, we're not going to make uh, bipartisan compromises, but you're going to have to compromise. In the end, the governor vetoed three bills and forced a special session. After the special session, they were basically the same bills mm -hmm. that got signed, except that the governor was arguing on education that we needed to have the pre-K. And in the end, maybe he wasn't really that committed to pre-K as long as it meant spending more money than he acquiesced on the pre-K. And we ended up spending $400 million more than the original proposal, uh, which uh, ended up with a 1.5% increase in fiscal year 16 and a 2% increase in fiscal year 17 on the base. And then there was another $125 million that was put into uh, school readiness, early learning scholarships, another $10 million for QCOMP, and the remainder of the $125 million was kind of dispersed in areas of special interest. So. Um, in the end, uh, you know, there really wasn't the need. We have another session coming up. If the governor felt so strongly about something, he should have advocated for it early in the session. And like most of us who have failed initiatives, you try again next year. Sure. And so that's what the governor, in my judgment, should have done. He should have signed the bills. They were bipartisan legislation. Uh, nothing, and even the governor said that uh, this is truly 
uh, a sign of a bipartisan uh, legislative session because nobody's happy. Sure, and that's the best negotiation ever, when everybody walks away feeling like they should have gotten more. Right, and, and so uh, there was extra cost associated with, with calling a special session and having 200 people come from all corners of the state and, and many people were out of state to have to return for the special session. A lot of extraordinary costs for what was not an extraordinary circumstance. You know, and the governor is two for two now because the last special session that we had, he ended up signing the bills as they were before. So it's interesting that he's not thinking about what, what's right for the people here. He's thinking about what he wants versus what the people need. And the legislatures, the, the other two legs, this House and the Senate, stuck together. And Well, last time uh, the session ended, this, the, the controversy over the special session in uh, 2011, I believe it was, ended. Uh, because the flow of beer was going to stop because we uh, couldn't renew the licenses. Right. And uh, thankfully this time, uh, as we enter the hot, humid summer, the beer is still flowing. Right. <laughs> and the parks are open. And, and everything is good again in Minnesota. Yeah. So. Well, thank you all for showing up today and, and for the work that you do. I'd like to remind our viewers that if you want to get a hold of them, if you don't agree with something that you heard today or you agree with what's going on, they all have websites. You can get a hold of each one of our legislatures, and they want to hear from you. They represent you. They want to hear from you, and they, will, they are working for you. So thank you all. I hope you have an absolutely wonderful summer, this, the, the second half here. And it won't be long before you're back in session, and we'll be uh, taping again what's, uh, what's going to be happening. Yeah. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Thanks. Thank you all. We'll see you next time on Capital Update.